Hi, I'm Michael Murray, and welcome to an exclusive look at Benzinga at PDAC 2024. Got an exciting show for you today and a lot to talk about, so let's go ahead and dive right in. PDAC is the world's premier mineral exploration and mining convention and one of the oldest with the first convention in 1932. Hosted by the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, the event is an important annual touchpoint for the entire industry. This year saw nearly 27,000 people from more than 130 countries descend on Toronto for four days. It featured 1,100 exhibitors and 700 speakers, top executives and thought leaders including Jacob Stossholm, CEO of Rio Tinto, Michael Stanley, the mining lead for the World Bank, Denise Johnson, group president at Resources Industries of Caterpillar Inc. The event comes at an exciting time for the industry, with gold trading at record highs, up about 20% over the last five months. Uranium has roughly doubled in the last year, and copper is up on news of reduced Chinese production and a likely supply crunch. Much of the conference centered around decarbonization and the global energy transition. These trends require massive amounts of critical minerals like copper and uranium, and the demand for these is likely to continue to grow. Benzinga had the chance to sit down with five leaders from throughout the industry, gaining valuable insights in the sector. We'll hear their thoughts on current trends, predictions for the future, and top picks for where smart money may be heading. First up, we have Patricia Moore, the former VP of Economics and Commodity Market Specialist at Scotiabank, one of Canada's largest banks. Mrs. Moore created the Scotiabank Commodity Price Index, the first index designed to measure price trends for Canadian commodities and export markets. Benzinga's Melanie Schaefer sat down with Mrs. Moore on March 4th to discuss what she's seeing in the market. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Um, thank you so much for joining us and happy thank International you. Women's Month. Thank you. Um, you have a lot of achievements in your portfolio from throughout your career. Can you tell us a bit about your history and your background? Well, I was one of the first vice presidents at Scotiabank, uh, a company, a great mining bank and mm -hmm. a company that has about 90,000 employees. So it was quite an honor. I, uh, I was vice president economics and commodity market specialist for the bank. And I uh, did the price forecasting for commodities for credit evaluations. So it really enjoyed doing that and had a lot of client work developed the Scotiabank Commodity Price Index, the first price index for commodities for Canada. That's uh, awesome and congratulations. Huge Thank congratulations you. on that. Um, you developed the Scotiabank Commodity Price Index. What do you see now? What are you bullish on? Well, I think in the mining space, uh, we do think that copper is going to do uh, particularly well. Uh, currently trading about $3.85 a pound on the LME and I think in a couple of years time it's probably going to move up uh, over five dollars a pound and that will be quite a profitable level. We need to see that because we do need to see some more new mines uh, get established around the world to meet the decarbonization goals that the world now has. I'm also very bullish on uranium uh, again, something uh, uh, really uh, uh, an energy source that emits almost no greenhouse gases and has very low other emissions. So it's very it's a very clean energy source. And I think that governments around the world are beginning to be interested in uh, nuclear power once more, including in Canada. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I think that's going to do particularly well. It's already had a bit of a run. A few years yeah. ago, it was trading about $40 a pound. Now, uh, just a bit over 100. And uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised in the next few years to see it reach its previous peak, which was some time ago. Uh, you know, about the $140 per pound level. So I think it's going to turn out to be a good investment for, for people. In terms of copper, what, have, what difficulties have, uh, what, ha what difficulties has the industry seen and the companies seen? Well, there've been a lot of operational problems. Um, uh, and of course, the one that is best known just uh, in recent months has been the shutdown of the Cobra Panama mine, uh, first quantum Cobra Panama mine uh, in Panama, something that was required by the government after a lot of social activism and uh, a uh, court decision 
by the Supreme Court of Panama uh, that really questioned uh, the uh, original details of the mining license. So that has been the, the thing that has really captured the attention of the copper market. But there have also been other announcements uh, pointing to uh, lower production this year, lower than was anticipated. And so uh, Anglo-American, for example, <coughs> excuse me, has uh, announced that its uh, production guidance is going to be lower for this year. And, uh, and we haven't seen a lot of new mines being actually commissioned, that is mm -hmm. new investment decisions. There are some new, mi some new mining capacity going to be started up this year and next, but it's a little bit less than people had anticipated six months ago. So um, I think the market is going to jump up uh, within the next year and a half, and uh, in the end, it will prove to be a very good investment. We see a lot of junior miners um, going after copper. Yes. Copper, gold, um, new penny stocks, I guess. Yes. Um, searching for those commodities. What are the difficulties that the junior mining, junior miners are facing? Well, because uh, commodity prices in the past year have not been uh, particularly good, uh, usually what happens is it's a junior mining sector that takes a toll from this. And uh, a lot of equity interest has really dried up. Now, of course, your uh, viewers will recognize that rare earth prices uh, tumbled last year uh, in China, and also lithium prices did quite a, um, mm -hmm. a, a tumble, had quite a yeah. tumble last year. So, uh, and copper is down a little, you know, it was trading a, a little over $4 a pound back in 2022, and right now a little bit less but holding up well. But I think the uh, a lot of uh, concern about the global economic outlook, uh, particularly in China, um, and uh, it has really taken a bit of a toll. Some of the decarbonization um, aspects, things like yeah. the, um, the demand for electric vehicles, uh, improving in the United States, but coming on a little slower than perhaps analysts had anticipated a few years ago. So the, the commodity prices have been mixed recently, mm -hmm. and it, has, it always takes a toll on the junior miners. Um, what are your thoughts on the oil and gas sector, speaking of EVs? Well, well, I think that, I mean, uh, I do think that electric vehicles um, are the future, but in the United States, it's coming on uh, fairly slowly, I would say. And um, I think it's because um, of some operational difficulties that consumers mm -hmm. realize the secondhand car market for electric vehicles isn't, doesn't hold up well. And uh, Americans are not uh, concerned about the outlook for oil because of course they are the world's biggest oil producer. And uh, after, well, really they lead Saudi Arabia and Russia. Okay. Canada, just for your viewers' yeah, yeah. Uh, interest, Canada is actually the fourth biggest oil producer in the world. So we, our economy in Canada is still very much attached to the oil, to the oil sector. I think, uh, so, I do think electric vehicles will come to, into their own in the second half of this decade, but um, a little more slowly in the United States than, for example, in China or in right. the Eurozone. And last question for you. What about lithium? Where do you see well, it? Well, lithium took quite a tumble last year. So the peak price for lithium carbonate in China, and China, of course, sets the tone on the lithium market. So in China, it peaked in December 2022 as 85,000 US dollars per tonny. It mm -hmm. fell down. The bottom was just a few weeks ago at about 13,300. Yeah, so yeah. quite a tumble. But last week, it actually edged up a bit. Okay. And, uh, and you may have noticed that some of the lithium stocks 
including in the United States, quickly responded to that. So investors are watching it very carefully and jumped in uh, to take advantage of some very low equity valuations. So I think it's going to come back slowly. You know, I think the latest price is uh, about 14,500 US dollars a ton E. And that little improvement has to do with the fact that there are environmental inspections at the mines in Jiangxi province in China. I think some of the converters in China may be worried about their domestic supplies. And after a period of about a year of uh, in inventory reduction, they're starting to rebuild their inventories once again. So that just reminded me, I do have one more question. Okay. <laughs> um, graphite. Yes. China curbed their export of um, that critical right. material. What right. do you see in terms of graphite for the future and for pricing? Well, um, I don't follow the prices of it in detail, but I do think it's likely to do quite well because supplies um, are fairly tight. Yeah. And I noticed that Novo Graphite in Quebec is doing very well. It's recently managed to secure two um, offtake agreements. Yes. So I, I do think it's likely to do quite well. That's great. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Next, Benzinga's Luke Jacoby sits down with Jason Barnard, president and CEO of Foremost Lithium. Mr. Barnard's company owns the Lithium Lane projects in Canada. Its five Lithium Lane projects are located in the heart of North America, close to manufacturers in the U.S. This gives Canada and the U.S. direct access to lithium deposits within NAFTA and critically outside of China. I'm here with Jason Barnard, President and CEO of Four Most Lithium. We are at PDAC in Toronto. Uh, Jason, you have an interesting history and background with the company. Tell me about your story getting involved with Foremost. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Luke. Um, my uh, history with Foremost goes back quite far. I was uh, uh, basically a financier for the company uh, for many years, and I financed their uh, uh, Fourier into uh, lithium. Uh, we also have an asset uh, in New Mexico. It's a very high-grade gold silver uh, producing uh, a gold silver situation. But uh, the lithium was what I was interested in uh, when I started investing uh, at that time into Foremost Lithium. And then I uh, uh, kept financing the company all the way to where I became the largest shareholder. Most recently, in the last year or so, I became the president and CEO uh, in order to uh, take more uh, of a role in the company. I'm also on the board, and that was so we could get listed on the NASDAQ. So last August 22nd, we listed on the NASDAQ uh, successfully, and uh, uh, that opens us up to a very large U.S. market. I'm excited to uh, work away at that, and uh, now, of course, I'm uh, the president and CEO and happy to be so. And congratulations on that NASDAQ listing. It's, it's not no simple feat. No, it, it was tough, but we got through it. Yeah, congratulations. Um, you know, Canada's Natural Resource Ministry uh, recently talked about investment in clean tech. Uh, you know, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for the business, et cetera? Well, it means big things. Uh, you know, it's all about onshoring the lithium supply and, and, and e electric vehicle supply chain into North America. So whether uh, you're looking at it uh, through a geopolitical lens or a uh, 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 other reasons why you would want to onshore it uh, for the safety of having our own uh, electric vehicle supply chain. Um, there's a, a real initiative for governments to help uh, uh, create that uh, industry here in North America and for free trade co uh, countries. So with us recently, we have, uh, have applied for a $10 million uh, infrastructure grant. And that grant will help us bring the cost down to deliver or uh, to the Tanko mine. In our area, we have one of the only two producing lithium concentrate mines in all of North America. One's in Quebec, the other is uh, somewhat close to us in Manitoba. So uh, we have a plan to direct ship ore uh, to the Tanko mine and an uh, application in for a $10 million grant from the federal government. And that's what it's all about right now. Uh, government's helping uh, uh, critical minerals and the EV supply chain. Great. And, and when uh, would you expect to hear back about that grant? It should, uh, the turnaround can be anywhere from three to four months. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, there was 
about that much lead time getting the application ready. A lot of work, uh, but our application is very good. I'm very confident about it. Wonderful. Uh, the price of lithium has been depressed recently. Um, how does that impact Foremost? How does that impact how you think about the business, uh, plans for the business, et cetera? Yes, well, um, I just mentioned uh, there's initiatives uh, uh, in North America to onshore the electric vehicle supply chain. So we are a little bit uh, sheltered here. We're trying to develop out our industry and uh, the lithium commodity or lithium carbonate prices have been depressed, but uh, because we're actually creating uh, the end users, uh, electric vehicle uh, manufacturers, electric battery makers, that's still in the work. So we have some time uh, to uh, 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 build our reserves and to set up our, our direct shipping ore strategy. Um, it doesn't really affect us, these short-term uh, uh, ups and downs. Um, I feel there's a longer-term bull uh, cycle involved with uh, lithium and, and all things electric vehicles. So I think the, the demand will carry on and it's just a short term uh, situation, but it doesn't really affect our bottom line because we're yet to be in production. We're yet to uh, uh, produce revenues. We're more in the drill off reserves and build that asset in the ground phase. And, and could you talk a little bit about what that production timeline looks like? The production timeline um, is, is into well into 2025. Um, now, in, in mining uh, exploration and, and, and in the mining business, that's relatively short term. Um, in fact, uh, that sort of sets, sets us away from um, uh, other companies in so far as a lot of uh, mining and exploration companies, it's about drilling that asset off in the ground. Um, and then, you know, a major will come and maybe buy that asset off you and they'll deal with uh, a revenue stream down the road and, and, and doing something with the asset. With us, uh, we're, we're focused on profitability for our company uh, and, and, and pr production and revenue stream for our company. So that sets us apart from other companies that we're hyper-focused on that. Yeah, wonderful. And my favorite question, if you had to name one thing you're most excited about, what would that be? Well, it's, it's easy to, uh, you know, if you look at our news releases, uh, FMST on the NASDAQ or FAT, on the CSC, you'll see that we started drilling. So I'm always excited to be drilling uh, and we're drilling where our reserve is, uh, our current resource uh, at Zorro in Snow Lake, Manitoba. So I'm really excited about what's coming so far as indications of results for the company. And then of course, uh, the carry on effect, which is growing that reserve to actually get some traction on uh, our, our direct shipping ore strategy, which is our revenue stream st strategy, and of course, the, what we hear from uh, the government on our $10 million uh, grant application. Wonderful. Those are the... That's Jason Barnard, President and CEO of Foremost Lithium. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Now we'll return to Melanie Schaefer, who spoke with Stu Averill, Chairman and Founder of Overburden Drilling Management Limited. Stu has been a pioneer in the advancement of technology within the industry, and Overburden is celebrating its 50-year anniversary at the forefront of innovation. Welcome, Stu. How are you finding the conference so far this year? Uh, surprisingly busy. It is. It is. I uh, was here yesterday. It was kind of light, but today uh, uh, it's it's really busy. In spite of the you know the downturn in the investments, it's extremely busy. Right. So I first want to congratulate you on 50 years with um, founder and CEO of Overburden Drilling Management. What are you celebrating? Well, we're celebrating, um, I guess, 50 years of uh, when I started out at the age of 28 with an idea of a, kind of a new exploration technique. Not really my idea, but um, it was, uh, I went on my own 10 years after the discovery of the big Kid Creek mine at Timmins. And that's really where the idea came from when they stripped the original open pit there. They're still mining there today, like two miles underground. Um, and uh, the geologists saw uh, uh, all these uh, boulders of ore, basically, uh, massive sulfide ore in the, in the glacial deposits, which we call till. And uh, they rightly deduced, oh, well, if there's that many boulders, there must be zillions more uh, sand-sized grains. And if we could just have a method to drill and recover those, uh, recover samples efficiently and concentrate those grains, we would be able to uh, find new ore bodies. So what exactly does ODM do? What's the technique? Well, that's what we do. Originally, uh, it was all uh, 
obtaining samples by drilling, but now much more surface. But basically in, in Canada, uh, what we are looking for is uh, dispersed mineral signatures of ore bodies that are dispersed during glaciation and uh, now occur in the deposits left by, by glaciation. We, we know which way the ice flows in every part of the country. Um, we're able to detect very low concentrations out of a, like, about a 10 kilogram sample, which is like a big sugar bag, um, at, at the one grain level. Uh, minerals that are very specific to our bodies. And so that's what we look for. Uh, it, means, it means that we have a very large target because the, basically the dispersal uh, starts off very strong at the ore body. You can imagine it gets diluted the further down the ice flow direction. And so uh, we can detect deposits uh, typically about 10 times further than you, away than you can with geochemistry which means you can take your samples 10 times further apart. So it really is economical and it's very distinctive because you're not just having a chemical anomaly, but you're actually seeing the grains from the deposit and its alteration. So, so you've had a few really good uh, discoveries over the course of your career. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk about a few of them or the top two? I think I'd like to mention particularly the, you know, this is very much a gold conference still. Yeah. So, uh, Probably uh, what we're most proud of is uh, the two gold discoveries that we led that are still producing today. And uh, so the first one was 10 years after I started, at Casabrardi in Quebec. And then uh, really st starting in 1994 with a junior company, New Insco, we found the first evidence of the Rainy River deposit. In, in Northwestern Ontario, right over near the Minnesota Manitoba border there, and um, uh, it New School wasn't able to carry that forward. But uh, a company came in ten years later, took it over Rainy River Resources, and uh, I actually became a director of Rainy River Resources because uh, we uh, were able to uh, my company Overbird Drilling Management was able to uh, further. Uh, further advance the discoveries, make new discoveries. In fact, we found the main ore body, ore body and Rainy River Resources kindly named that ODM zone, which they're still mining today uh, after, uh, after my company, ODM. That's great. Um, right now, you're also a director of Tower Resources. Yes. Um, there's a couple of great properties that Tower owns, um, specifically Rabbit North that you've been working on. Can you talk about what you've been finding there in the different zones? Yes, um, well, uh, the, the people behind Tower are basically some of the same people, including me, uh, from the Rainy River team. And so we uh, have, uh, there's an area, through basically the whole central area in BC, um, is, which is about the size of the entire Abitibi Belt in Ontario, Quebec, where it is, um, is uh, very amenable and, and very raw for the type of discoveries that that we have been making for 50 years, um, and uh, but it's, it hasn't caught much traction there. But one of the companies, you know, because of the Rainy River connection, I suppose, uh, is Tower Resources, and uh, uh, particularly the Rabbit North property, uh, which is uh, uh, just outside of Kamloops, sitting nicely between two producing mines, mm -hmm. uh, New Afton and uh, of New Golds and uh, the largest copper mine in Canada, Tex uh, Highland Valley. Um, so it's, it's very fertile terrain, but the historic, there's a, there's a ridge on the property um, of, of the right kind of rocks to host uh, a porphyry copper gold deposit. And that, had been, that ridge had been explored for 50 years. Um, and they found plenty of areas of mineralization, not really that many, only about one, 10 areas, maybe one that you could actually call a zone. So lots of smoke on that ridge, but nobody ever went down to the lower slopes of that uh, but, and into the valleys around it because that is till covered uh, using those glacial, the, with the glacial deposits like we were used to using. So, so uh, just over a two year period from um, May of, uh, 2021, we uh, for for Tower ODM did a, uh, a 
an indicator mineral survey, in this case a gold grain survey, uh, hoping to find a, a larger uh, porphyry copper gold deposit underneath that till. Uh, by using the gold signature, not the copper signature, right. because we could detect it from further away. Uh, that was very revealing, that first study. It, uh, um, we were able to identify the signature of that mass signature from 10 kilometers down ice, but more so we had uh, uh, a very intriguing concentration of, very high concentration of gold grains, not on this ridge, not uh, not even uh, the, the, the ridge itself is an intrusion, but um, in the till covered volcanics below the ridge. And uh, that led to a follow up program just six months later, and uh, five months later, actually in October. And um, the, the results were so definitive from the gold grains that we were able to go direct to diamond drilling two months later. and. Uh, with uh, with our third hole, we hit the source of the gold grains, which we called the lightning zone because we discovered it so fast. Uh, seven months from the first till sample, 10 kilometers away to um, to drilling. And that first intersection is 95 meters, which is about the length of a football field mm -hmm. um, of 1.4 grams per ton gold, starting basically a surface under the glacial deposits. So... Um, you know, not uh, so uh, kind of ideal conditions, I guess. Right. And, and certainly among the higher grades of, of what you might expect for open pit deposit. Um, so you, there was just news that came out uh, this morning. Um, you, Tower Resource is getting ready or starting to think about getting ready for the next program. Mm -hmm. What are you looking forward to this year? Yes, we got our five-year permit uh, renewed. So... Um, this year will be the first year. Um, we, uh, after lightning, we, uh, in, uh, in, in 2020, 20, 22, 23, we also found just 400 meters to the west, a, a second pair of gold deposits, which we called thunder, thunder and lightning. Yep. And we inadvertently hit what we were, those are just straight gold deposits, not, they weren't expected in that area. But on the, one of those holes, that we intersected Thunder South Zone in the upper part of it. We also intersected what we went there for in the first place, which was a porphyry copper gold zone. So yeah. we have um, these well-defined targets. So it's really all about drilling from here on. Um, we, we did a mag survey a year ago to help. It's of some help, but basically we know where to drill. We, uh, uh, our geological team, uh, we, I've been working with there. Um, we we uh, we're we're ready to go. We uh, we could use as most junior companies. We could use a larger budget, but uh, For sure. we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. But we'll certainly be able to work forward with some drilling. Well, we year. sort of look to be at the bottom of the market right now. Yeah. Gold hit twenty one hundred today. Yes. Um, why is copper important? Copper is important because. Um, um, I suppose some people would say because it's a critical mineral all of a sudden, but copper is important for tower because a lot of the, the, the big gold companies are interested in copper and therefore they're interested in copper and gold together. Right. And so um, certainly uh, there's that interest uh, of a Rabbit North property from the straight gold side and the older deposits uh, geologically about 50 million years older which is the copper gold so it's uh, attractive to um, two different types of, of companies i guess next melanie sits down with julie piquet vice president communications and esg strategy for novu mon the company is working to create a fully integrated source of graphite for the green energy industry graphite is a key component of lithium-ion batteries but it's often overlooked by investors focused on lithium itself Hi, Julie. Hi. How are you finding the conference so far? Very interesting. And I find there's a greater uh, interest and visibility on battery materials, those critical minerals on our everybody's lips. So I think it's a kind of a new era for mining. So it's exciting. Yeah. So if we start at the basics, 
Graphite mm -hmm. is a critical uh, material or mineral that people don't often talk about. What's it used for? Yeah, so we say graphite is a bit of the underdog of all those battery materials. So graphite, you'll find it in the negative electrode of your lithium ion battery. So everybody's very focused on the cathode where you'll find copper, nickel, lithium, and all of these yeah. other kind of high visibility metals. I know there's actually 95% made of graphite. So no, no graphite, no anode, no anode, no battery. And so those batteries are in your phone, in your laptop, but also in EVs. And this is where there's a huge market opportunity for graphite. So graphite prices haven't been um, rising recently. They've been sort of at a lull. Um, but in October of last year, the Chinese government announced um, that they were going to be curbing exports of graphite. What do you think that will do for the price of graphite and how will it benefit Nouveau Monde? Yeah, so, you know, graphite is very unique in terms of market because China really controls the supply chain. They mine 75 percent of natural graphite, but they control 95 percent of the spherical graphite for, for the lithium ion batteries. So with them restri restricting exports with the, gov the U.S. government, also with the IRA and the foreign entity of concern definition, pointing to China as a uh, problematic uh, sourcing partner, it creates a huge opportunity for North American developers like Nouveau Monde. So we are lucky to have two large deposits located in Quebec, just at the market doorstep. We have the capacity to, for processing, all of the value added transformation. So it really enables us to tap into this market that is gonna kind of dissociate from China and we're expecting prices to also dissociate and really have very two different markets evolving between Asia and North America. So um, companies like yourself who um, are mining graphite, are you noticing that offtakes are becoming more competitive? that you have more companies coming looking for graphite. Yeah, so I think we've we've been engaged with battery and EV manufacturers for a number of years thanks to our phase one uh, facilities where we are producing graphite as of today. And so it enables us to have some very active discussion and product qualification with customers. But with the IRA, with the China's restrictions, mm -hmm. Uh, we've seen the conversation kind of change and accelerate and manufacturers are really, really interested in securing supplies. We've just announced two offtakes with Panasonic and GM covering 85% of our production out of our phase two facilities. And we've got a number of other customers just waiting mm -hmm. and interested in also going through all of the steps to qualify and to reserve some volumes for out of our phase two, but also out of our phase three for our other mining projects. So, there is a growing need for those manufacturers to find alternatives to China's supply. And we are ideally located in Quebec. We have a very high ESG profile and we can develop with them this kind of new dynamic, this new supply chain being fully local and fully integrated. Right, so one of the issues that investors are sometimes concerned about is the environmental impact of mining. So what does Nouveau Mont try to do to become a sustainable company? Yeah, correct. And, you know, of course, mining, you are developing a finite resource and you need to do it responsibly. And that has always been our motto at, at Nouveau Mont. And that's part of our name as well, right? New mm -hmm. World Graphite, we're trying to do something a little different. So we're all about responsible mining. We've committed to being fully electric at the mining site. We've partnered with Caterpillar that is going to help us build this 100% all electric mine. It's going to be the world's first for an open pit mine, but also partnering with indigenous partners, with communities, with the local workforce, trying to find opportunities to really create value for all of the stakeholders involved in mining uh, so that it can be really sustainable for everybody in the long term. Right, so going back to the um, offtake deal with Panasonic and GM, which was extremely exciting for retail investors, as you could see in, in the social chats online, um, retail investors also can't be feeling very frustrated with Nouveau Monde this year because of it's been really a continuous news flow coming out, um, starting even with January 31st, where you announced um, that you had taken over Mason Graphite. Um, you've also secured a lot of funding through private placements. What's exciting? What, what do investors have to look forward to next? Yeah, so 
you know, as we look to 2024, it's going to be a super important year for us because we'll be refining the engineering and uh, updating our CapEx projections for the phase two uh, construction. So we'll be actively engaged with strategic investors, with customers, with lenders to finalize that uh, project financing and get to the final investment decision. Uh, we are also, uh, as we mentioned, in a number of commercial discussions with other manufacturers, so we could see other announcements coming out. Um, and I think that the market is going to really crystallize this year for the battery material space, and we're seeing a lot of offtakes, and we're, we're moving in that direction. So you said you have two projects. Can you tell um, me the difference between the two? Yeah, sure. So we have the Metawini mine two, hour, two hours north of Montreal. This is our flagship mining project, fully permitted. Uh, we've started early construction on that site uh, and we are waiting for project financing to get into kind of the more active construction. It is tightly linked to our Bicampool battery material plant. That site will be taking the graphite concentrate out of metal. We need to transform it into active anode material. So covering all the steps uh, from shaping, purification and coating that are required for graphite to enter a lithium ion battery. So the Panasonic and GM of this world are buying production out of our battery material plant. This is our phase two that is going to get to the final investment decision towards the end of the year, early next year. Okay. Um, and we also have a phase three with the acquisition of the other deposit, the Watman Mining Project. So because we have so much interest from commercial partners, we wanted to reserve the capacity for expansion and for that large deposit that is five times greater than the Metawini mine. So this is the project that we'll be developing as soon as we kick start construction on our phase two. We'll be getting to the feasibility study and further development stages for the, the, the expansion uh, on the wetland mine project. That's fantastic. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with investors? Um, I think I think it's an exciting yeah, time for battery materials, as I mentioned, but that people are getting um, more acquainted with the space and all of the different minerals and materials. So I invite investors to do their due diligence and look at graphite uh, because there's a great story, a great opportunity. And really, North America is well positioned uh, to take some some market share out of China in that space. And investors are really buying the bottom now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. My pleasure. And to round things out, Benzinga's Brad Olison sits down with investing legend Rick Rule of Rule Investment Media. Mr. Rule has a long history of investing in the commodities markets and has grown a loyal following for his focus on contrarian investing and commodity cycles. Mr. Rule spoke about the opportunities in the market he's seeing and his picks for the coming few years. All right. We're with Rick Rule, Rule Investment Media on the sidelines of PDAC. Uh, Rick, why don't you just give us a, a short background about your firm and uh, your views on contrarian investing, and uh, we can maybe start with some industry life cycles such as oil and gas. Rural Investment Media is an outgrowth of 50 years of investing in natural, resource invest natural resources, and the fact that a lot of people over 50 years have come to like to listen to me, really. Uh, overlaid that as something called Rural Classroom, where there's a couple hundred hours of instructional material on how to invest in natural resources. The important lesson going to your question is that these businesses are capital intensive and cyclical, meaning that the cure for low prices is always low prices and the cure for high prices is always high prices. As an investor in resources, if you aren't a contrarian, you're going to be a victim. It's as simple as that. You talk a lot about easy money um, and sure mining. Uh, what are the best th hallmarks and, and what are the blind sides uh, that investors have developed in regards to this? Uh, easy money ends up being hard psychologically, uh, meaning that you have to invest in commodities that are so deeply out of favor that the selling price of the commodity is below the industry average cost of production, which is to say you have to have the guts to invest in industries in liquidation. The reason that you do that is because if, com because if an industry isn't earning its sustaining capital requirements, the commodity becomes unavailable. So as an example, when the oil price was at $20, costs the industry $60 to make it. Either the price of oil would go from 20 to 60 or your car wouldn't start. You need to think which is more probable. That's what I mean about the easy money. I see. And then I guess we can parlay that into the current 
characteristics in, your, in the uranium market, I think in particular, like how does this bull market differ from some of the uranium booms maybe in the mid to late 2000s? Well, I would say in this market, the easy money has been made. The period 2022 to 2024 was the easy money. If you had talk about, talked about uranium in 2022, which I did ad nauseum, nobody cared. Or if they did care, they were hostile. They accused you of trying to make money on Fukushima or, or, or Hiroshima. <laughs> Uh, now that the price of uranium has gone from 20 bucks a pound to 100, now that it doesn't have to go up anymore, everybody wants to be interested. Uh, right. It's odd that those people who vilified me now want stock picks. <laughs> um, I guess that's human nature. What's really unique about uranium is that any, unlike any other mineral commodity business I know, there's a very, very, very big term market, contract market. And as more of the volume goes from the spot market to the term market, what will happen is that the producers will have price certainty for a very long time. You don't see that in any other commodity. I think the consequence of that is that five years out, the capital cost of putting a mine in production will be lower and the equity multiples will be higher simply because of the certainty around the top line revenue number. Any particular names in uranium that you're looking at now? I mean, for most people, most people should start with the biggest and the best because they won't do the work to own the speculative names. So most people should own Cameco. If people want to be a little gamier, they can buy the ETFs. I, of course, being a large Sprott shareholder, would prefer that they bought the Sprott <laughs> ETF, right. the largest. Now, the truth is that there are probably 80 or 90 juniors in the space, 12 or 15 of which are viable. But for people who buy the juniors, they need to understand that they need to do the work. They need to read the quarterlies. They need to read the insider reports. They need to read the property filings. They need to do all that. Most people's technique with the juniors has got a hunch, bet a bunch, and that doesn't work. And then obviously the juniors in a little bit of different situation than some of the, the, the major producers. Where are you seeing their challenges and the challenges for the industry at, uh, as a whole? I think the, the juniors like Next Gen, Fission, Deep Yellow, their challenges are behind them. Uh, their challenges were survival. Uh, they're long past that. They have established resources that are more than economic at these prices. Yeah. They have the ability, unlike any other commodity I know, to sign offtake agreements with investment grade counterparties, which they can literally take to the bank. Right. Now, the hyper juniors, the explorers, have the problem of the fact that although uranium is doing well, they don't have any uranium. They're looking for it. Okay. <laughs> and that is a challenge. If the price of something that you don't have any of goes up, it shouldn't have any impact on your intrinsic value. And then your views on, you know, we'll pivot just quickly over to silver. Right. Are, are, you, are you still a silver bull? Uh, silver bull. Am I ever a silver bull? Interesting question. Silver historically has followed gold. So gold has to establish some momentum before silver kicks in. And silver has to kick in before the silver stocks kick in. When is this going to occur? I don't know. What I do know is that silver stocks, with the exception of uranium stocks, are the most volatile of all resource stocks. I remember early in my career, Coeur d'Alene mines in the 70s going from 10 cents to $65, sadly without me. In the next cycle, however, I remember both Silver Standard and Pan American going from 72 and 50 cents respectively to $45. And mercifully, I was in those. So with me, silver speculation is personal. It's worked for me. It may be two years from now, it may be three years from now, it doesn't matter to me because when it moves, the type of moves that occur make up for an awful lot of lost time. Right, very volatile. And then any sort of other materials that you see kind of cropping up as, as far as the investors interest? Well, I think the easiest place for investors, maybe not speculators, the easiest place for investors to make money is carbon, oil and gas. Uh, the market hates them. Yeah. They're great big businesses. The big thinkers of the world, the Joe Bidens, the Justin Trudeaus, that noted energy physicist Greta Thornburg, uh, would have you right. believe that uh, conventional hydrocarbon fuels go away in 2030, which is totally insane. Let me leave a statistic with your audience. Uh, our species has invested $5 trillion in alternative energies over 40 years. We've reduced the market share of hydrocarbons from a high of 82% all the way down to 81%. Right. Uh, the half-life of oil and gas reserves is probably 2060, which is to say 35 years from now. Yeah. 
uh, there's a lot of light life left in that business, particularly yeah. for your Canadian viewers. And oil, we're seeing oil prices creep up here, natural gas prices they don't, creep up here. They don't have to creep up. They just yeah. have to stay where they are. Right. These companies are making so much money. If they are investing in sustaining capital, which not all of them are, uh, this is going to be an easy business for a decade. Right. They'll just have to fight the regulatory regimes. Or, or even just perception. Yeah. And that concludes Benzinga at PDAC 2024, where we got an exclusive look inside the industry. As decarbonization and the green energy transition march forward, critical minerals are likely to continue to be valuable investments. Join us next year for PDAC 2025.